Aloha, and welcome to On The Go with yours truly, Ian Davidson, the show where you get whatever we're going to give you. Today we're going to be talking about the Constitution and things that um, we are interested in when it comes to that. I have Stan Osterman, host of um, many shows here at Think Tech. He, he wants to talk about it, and I do too, and we think that you guys will enjoy it. Stan, how are you doing? Good, yeah, thanks right for having me on. Thank you for being on. Kind of weird being on this side of this, the table. Yeah, that's yeah. weird being in front of the camera for me, to be quite honest. We are going to talk about the Constitution, and I'll be quite honest, right, from the get-go. I've looked at it. I don't want to say that I'm an expert at it. And I'll, you find people talking about it a lot, and people saying things that they believe are true to them because it's what they've either learned or what they've inferred from people talking, all that kind of stuff. What kind of things in the Constitution do you feel people miss the mark on? Actually, I, I, you know, as we were talking a little bit earlier, I think that a lot of people call themselves Muslims or Christians or, or Jews or whatever, and they never read the source documents. They never read the Bible or the Torah or the, or the um, Quran, and yet they talk like they're experts in their religion, and, and they think they really know what those religions stand for. Likewise, the Constitution, like you said, I think other than what you get in school, which depending on whether you're, there was big surf that day or not, you may or may not have gotten anything out of that class because uh, you had your mind on girls or surfing or something else. I mean, if that's the only time you got any education on the Constitution, um, which is actually the case for me, uh, you probably don't recall a whole lot or don't really know what's in there. Um, for me, you know, I, I decided to go in the military at the ripe old age of 25. And when I did that, um, I went in with the, the um, objective of becoming a, a pilot and flying for the airlines. I didn't think about getting killed in combat. I didn't think about the oath I was taking. I mean, I, I mean, I did them and I swore in and everything. And I know that oath by heart now because I had to give it so many times. But you swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States. And you say you'll obey the orders of the president. And you swear you're going to do that. And when you're in the military, you're doing that with your life. So. Probably about, I don't know, halfway into my lower end of my, my flying career, I decided, you know, I probably ought to re really read what I stood up and, and took the oath for. So I, I got a copy of the Constitution. And this one was published by the government and given to the military probably in 1990 or thereabouts. It actually has a government printing office number. And I've carried it in my briefcase ever since, and I read it from time to time. I make up points like the this Constitution actually defines the entire army and navy of the United States in 42 words, and yet it describes the, the militia, the National Guard, in 70 words. And you can tell this is a very concise document. I wish the tax code was this big. But this is a very elegant document. It establishes the entire government of our country in something this small. And this isn't just the Constitution. This has got a couple pages of introductions and even some te some references at the end, significant dates, and all the amendments ever made to the Constitution up to probably 1990, which is all but one. It has all the amendments of the Constitution. So the first 10 were the Bill of Rights, so they're actually adopted right after the Constitution. So in the last 250-ish years, 17 amendments to the Constitution, not a whole lot. It's a pretty unique, I'd call it an elegant document, and it sets up our whole country. It tells the president what his role is, it tells the Congress what their role is, it, role is. it tells the, the um, judicial branch what their role is and how they check and balance each other. And it even, like I said, I, as a guard guy um, and a military guy, I focused in on Article 1, Section 8, which was part where we talk about the militia and what the role of the militia is because it rolls right into Second Amendment, too, as we talked about a little bit earlier, keeping and bearing of arms, in that we've never had a teacher's union take over a government. We've never had a plumber's union take over a government or a bunch of radical kindergartners take over government. But you do have militaries take over governments. So in this country, another check and balance that's not taught in school is the fact that every governor owns a piece of the United States federal military. Like, Governor Ige doesn't own F-22s but he owns all the people that fly and maintain those F-22s. He doesn't own you know, a, a brigade of, of Army Guardsmen, but he has a couple thousand Army Guardsmen under his command that if he 
sincerely doesn't want the president to go to war, he'll tell the president, I'm not letting you take my guys. Will, will there be a fight? Yeah, there'll be a fight. There'll be a, a legal fight. Mm -hmm. But some of these things have never been challenged in a court of law, never been challenged. In fact, you know, when you, you ask about, you know, my feelings, I'd say that probably two-thirds of the laws in our country have never been challenged at the Supreme Court level, more, probably way more than that even. And we have laws on the books that probably should be wiped off because they're A, obsolete, or B, totally unconstitutional, but they're there. And we just kind of go with them until somebody contests them. And so I think it's really important that more people read the Constitution. I agree. I think that, a lo I, to be honest, I should. I should. But I fear that, like most people, it seems very, you know, you know, like you said, it's like this is how it is. It's really simple. It's it should be easy to understand. But when you go out there and you hear people that will s read something and say this is this is what it means, and then you have another person say it, a, a complete different thing. It's it's very hard for people to. Uh, you have to pick a side. Which you know what I mean. It's sure. what really ends up happening is people have to pick a way to understand it. You know, it's like yeah. I, with religions. There's you know you brought up. Uh, Islam, mm -hmm. and they're the people that are in uh, that follow that religion. They are the ones that read it or don't you know, understand it in their head to, to mean this. And then there's the other side, and it, it, exactly the same thing happens with the Constitution. And it's it's interesting that <clears throat> is that was that do you think that that's how the Constitution was written, of so course. that it can be interpreted in it, so many different ways that it makes it sort of not stringent I, on I, people? No, I wouldn't say that it can be interpreted so many ways. In fact, it's, it's pretty fundamentally right. structured. But what it does allow is a freedom of dialogue and civil discourse. It lets you talk about differences peacefully. It lets you change government, including a fairly radical change in policy government, peacefully. In fact, one of the this copy that we got issued when I was a, a young officer, I'd like to read. This is by uh, Chief Justice Warren Berger, who was the commission, the guy who in charge of the the committee that put this whole project together. It was really to commemorate the Constitution. It says in the last quarter of the 18th century, no nation in the world was governed with the separated and divided powers providing checks and balances on the exercise of authority by those who governed. Nobody in the whole world. First time in the world anybody came up with something like this constitution. A first step towards such a result was taken with the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and followed by the Constitution, which is drafted in Philadelphia in 1787. In 1791, the Bill of Rights was added, and each of the uh, antece antecedents backed back to the English Bill of Rights and the Magna Carta and beyond were included in, in this, in this com compiling to make the Constitution and what it is today. The work of 55 men in Philadelphia in 1787 was another blow to the concept of divine right of kings. So it really was a, a pushback on the monarchy in England. But the freedoms flowing from the Constitution created a land of opportunities. And ever since, and ever since then, the discouraged, the oppressed people from every part of the world have made their way to our shores. There were others too, educated, affluent, seeking a new life and new freedoms in a new land. This is the meaning of our Constitution. The principal goal of the Bicentennial Commission was to stimulate and appreciate and understand uh, our national heritage, a history of a civics lesson for all of us. The lesson cannot be learned without first reading and grasping the meaning of this remarkable document, the first of its kind in human history in human history. Right. That's what makes, uh, I think, what makes the U.S. different. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, the U.S. is different because we're so rich, we're so powerful, we have a huge, powerful military, and we do. Um, but that's not why we're rich. We're rich because of this. We're rich because, for the first time, we had people that were making the government and limiting the government to what the people said they wanted instead of having kings dictate. Because there's a lot of people who love monarchies and say there's nothing better than a benevolent dictator. And it's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great while well, it lasts, but then the successor may not be so great. Yeah, chopping off and when heads. He, he's got all the power, yeah. yeah. He's hanging people and chopping off heads because he doesn't like what they say. Um, that's not good. So the Constitution sets down the framework 
with everything that the, that should be put in government to give the power to the people being governed versus the power being held by a few people at the top and directing what everybody should do. And I think that's really the beauty of the, the Constitution. What do you say, I, I agree, I think that that is, I mean, without that there is no America. It's what, it's like the seed kind of for America. What do you say, you know, I agree. I think that people, we have the ability, it's right there to say, whoa, checks and balances. You see it on TV. You see it happening, I guess, in politics here and in our government and the three branches of government. And you will hear people say, I can do it. I can just do it. And then when somebody says, no, you can't, wait, check. I'm check, it's right here. Then you hear people say, Whoa, you can't do that. Are those people, do those people just not know that that's how it works? I mean, you know, like the president, let's just president, or we, we don't have to even point him out. We'll point, let's just say, a, the head of a dem, the highest Democrat tries to do something. Someone's going to say, Whoa, you can't do that. And if Democrats go, Whoa, yes, you can. Well, let's look, you know, let's look at the president. Uh -huh. let's, let's take the case of the president. And it strikes right home here in Hawaii. Yeah. The president put out an executive order that said, we're going to temporarily limit the people coming into our country from certain other countries until we can vet them properly. And first the state of Washington, followed up a few month, a month or so later by the state of Hawaii, filed a court, uh, a court mo motion to stop that executive order. Did President Trump go, screw you guys, I'm doing it anyway? No. No, he didn't. He respected the, the rule of the court, and he'll take it through the judicial, judicial process. As opposed to, you've got people who, in Berkeley, for example, who don't want somebody speaking in an, in an engagement, and instead of just saying, hey, this, is, this person has a bad message, and you should boycott that speech, they go out and destroy windows and, person, and private property and public property, and the law enforcement doesn't seem to do anything to stop them. There's a big problem there. There's there's a part of the of probably our whole culture that's missing lately, and it seems to be civility. Yeah. It seems to be just good manners. Maybe we're not teaching good manners in school anymore or respect for other people. But the Constitution makes it really clear that everybody's equal. Right. And so you have a right to say what you want to say, and so do I. And you don't have a right to sit there and gag me or right. tie me up and throw me in the corner and say shut up I don't like what you're saying and I don't have the right to do it to you either. Right. We can disagree all we want but we can agree to disagree at the end of the day. Agree. What I w am interested in though in this in that, in that exact sort of scenario is what we saw was the president do something then the checks come in and then the president can't do nothing now. He's got to wait. Right. He's got to let the checks and balances of what the Constitution mm -hmm. set up. There were our people that believe that that right there, the boycott Hawaii thing, we're going to boycott Hawaii. It's the same thing. Those people clearly believe that what that judge has done was wrong okay. and it shouldn't be happening. Whereas when I look at it, I just see the process happening. It's just happening. You know, like a lot of people get, they get really hot about it because they're invested in it. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, part of any party. I'm sort of, just, I try to play the innocent bystander as much yeah. as I can. Because I think the Constitution says, I am me. And how I feel is kind of how it is, and I have to play within the rules, you know? And so, like, I don't really join parties okay. and stuff like that or try but, to grow. But I see the process, and I hear people, like, right. wigging out about the process. And, is, and my, my question, I guess, is, is that just, just, is that just that ignorance of not knowing? Or the Well, I, I think what, or whatever what it really terms? is going to take, and, and I, what I think is really the beauty of the process is, the president has respected the process, and he's respected the court, although other people pretty much badmouth the court for their decisions mm -hmm. and say, well, it's all being politically driven, and that's someone's opinion. Um, the people who want to boycott Hawaii, that's their opinion too, right. and they can do it. What would really benefit us is if we could get this thing resolved in the courts quickly, and then we would understand, because the, the job of the courts is to decide whether the law is constitutional or not, to decide whether that judge was actually within the bounds of the legal process, the legal system, the legal guidance to do what he did. And, and we need to resolve that quickly yeah. and move on. If you look at what's going on Because if it ends lot, up being if it ends exactly. up being unconstitutional, we move on and we just don't exactly. have it. Exactly. Travel ban done. Done. We press forward. Yeah. 
And so I, I think that one thing that the Constitution tries to do, at least in criminal cases, is gives you the right to a speedy trial in a criminal case. Right. Okay. But it doesn't necessarily give you that right in a civil case or in, in these larger cases, especially if it's going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. There's nobody that says it's got to be done in two weeks. And most of the lawyers will try and drag it out even longer because they want to do more homework and more research and things like that. I agree. I think that the, that checks and balance process is in place for good for the reason, for a really good reason. It just needs to be figured out how to do it. I need to go to a break. I'm getting anything in there. Um, Stan Osserman, super excited to have him on the show. We're talking about the Constitution or what little I might know, and we're learning stuff. If you are right on, if you're listening on the podcast, thanks a lot. I have to go to a break. About a minute. We'll be right back. Thanks for tuning in. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I used to be a part of all the things that you might be angry at. I served in government here and may have made decisions that affects you. So I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in to talk story with me and some very special guests every other Monday here at Talk Story with John Waihe. Come on in, join us, express your opinion, learn more about your state, and then do something about it. Aloha. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Right on. Welcome back. Um, this is On The Go. I'm Ian Davidson. We're here with Stan Osterman. We're chatting about the Constitution. We were just talking about um, how people do things, the checks and balances, how some of the things that work could work better a bit. We're going to talk about some more stuff. What do we want to talk about? We want to talk about, let's talk about liberalism and conservatism. What okay. are your thoughts? Yeah, this is actually really kind of the crux of, of what I think has kind of come to a point over the last 10 or 15 years. Because being a military person, by nature I tend to be conservative in a, in a real classic definition of I, I, I swore to defend the Constitution, which is about as conservative as an American as you can get when you say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to protect the document you know, that, that founds our country. So you know, I, I kind of align with, with conservative principles. What I find really actually fascinating is that when you look at definitions of liberal and conservative, over years and decades and centuries and millennia, it's different. And if you look at the definition of, of liberal and democratic, you're looking at the definition that's in the Constitution. Right of the people, rule of law, you know, all those things that are outlined in the Constitution are all democratic principles. And at the time, they were liberal principles because the conservative view was monarchies. So our entire Constitution is looked at from the foundation as being liberal. But now, 200 and something years later, conservative means I back the old liberal Constitution. Right. It's almost, so yeah. it's, it's like the roles have, have become very muddied. And when people say they're conservative or liberal, a lot of times it's not so clear. In fact, I've had somebody tell me that if you really took the population of, of Hawaii, which is predominantly Democrat, and I mean, we don't even have a Republican in the state Senate anymore, mm -hmm. and you look, but you looked at their actual values and their, you know, where they line up on a whole bunch of issues, you'd find that they actually probably line up more conservative by definition than liberal. Um, there's some things here that are really strong. Unions are strong. That's pretty contemporary liberals. Union, um, having, having, taking care of everyone. Um, everyone in every way is a liberal viewpoint in today's, today's books. Whereas conservatives say, you know, we want everybody to have a chance. But if we're going to be paying for everybody's everything, then at some point, you know, you're going to run out of people doing the work because you're going to have too many people just on the dole. And, and the conservatives kind of see that extreme. So it's a really weird time to be, to be engaged in politics right now because the definitions have just changed, yeah. so, changed so much over time. But 
one of the things that I think really um, gets back to our constitutional part is that we've also come to a point where compromise is not so easy anymore. Because, like I say, you have, you've gotten to the point where on the, on the liberal side, or the more progressive side, they've pushed the limits on things like abortion and, and things like that to where it's coming smack head on against religious values on the conservative side where people who really do read the Bible, fundamental Bibleists, born-again Christians, you know, they read the Bible and, and they know what's in there. And whether it's abortion or gay rights or whatever, we're starting to have conflicts where you just can't compromise anymore without compromising your core values. Mm -hmm. And once you get down to compromising core values, you're going to have conflict. And I think we're really close to that point. That's why a lot of people, when they look at politics nowadays, they see a danger because they see people being anarchistic to get their points across and literally trying to Mm -hmm. shut you up with violence just to get their point across. And then people on the other side who just won't move because, I'm sorry, you're backing my, my, me against a religious wall, mm-hmm. and I won't compromise anymore. And we're hitting the stalemate points, and it is kind of dangerous. It's kind of scary. So I think it's, it's really time for kind of a, a reassessment of what's American, and look at what's American, and redefine ourselves together as what's American. I hear that, and what, you know what I, I'm totally on board then. That leads me to think of the Constitution again. The Constitution is pretty solid, rock solid. You said it, it, it. One of my sort of things with it is that I happen to believe that it's kind of fluid. It has changed over time. It is not the same thing it was on day one. I know that it's been a very long time since there's been change, and that might be because the way to make changes to it, it might be connected to that sort of hardening of the lines Mm -hmm. as they spread out over time, that to come to the compromise, which would be potentially a change to that, well, to make that an sort example. of, I don't know, I just feel like that for a, for the for like the religious aspect of it, freedom of religion in there. Mm-hmm. That's because, this is just the basic knowledge, high school, barely made it through, um, is that you can have your religion here in, in America and the government cannot tell you you can't. Right? And that's basically it's even, because... It's even less than that. It's one sentence in the First mm-hmm. Amendment and the Bill of let's Rights. Let's hear it. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Of one. So, so here we are. They can have it. You can have whatever religion. And if your religion now is the one sole thing that blocks you from compromise, and you just say, well, it's my religion... You can't break that, right? You can't tell me it's wrong. You can't yeah. tell me you can't say it. I know you just started the church of what's happening now last week, didn't right, you? Right, exactly. And I'm right up against the Constitution. It's, how do we get to that without sort of bending it? And, then, and we can sort of tie that travel ban into it because the uh, proponents of it think that it's, it's that right there. You can't sort of say religion is a reason why we are now saying you can't do this. And right or wrong, it's up to the, the courts to check that. Well, and that's why I see that we have a good social discussion on it. And we might even have referendums. I mean, yeah. we don't generally do big referendums. Some states do them. But we may have to actually get to that point where we have referendums. Um, because you, you're going to get to these points where you really have to have a a solid discussion on, I mean, even on th- real controversial things like abortion. Mm-hmm. I mean, on the liberal side, um, it's women's reproductive rights. It's the choice of a woman and doctor to make the decision what's best for the woman. On the conservative side, it's, well, then who's speaking for the unborn child? Right. That unborn child is potentially a, an American citizen and is viable at, a, at a, even a fairly young age with today's modern medicine. Who's speaking for that voice that doesn't have a voice? Who's defending their rights? Because in our Constitution, they have rights too. It's right. just a matter of defining when you're considered a human being See, and when I, you're this not. This is what, why. And those what are where we start to run up against these tough, these tough blocks where you're going to have to have a little bit more dialogue, and there probably is going to have to be some compromise right to some very fine lines. Right, where someone ends up being a loser in that, and so both, you know, like in a compromise. If you're going to be a real general and compromise, both sides lose, both sides win. That's the happy medium. That's not going to be the case with something like that. Like, if for that to happen, it seems as if almost 
the decision has to be made. And in America, where do we stamp that decisions of really importance that matter across the land? It's in that. But, but in that. I think that's where I say we've gotten to a point where we may have to start doing referendums where we put things on a ballot and say, okay, America, here's your choices. It's this, 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 or this. You know, maybe you have four or five choices. Mm -hmm. Pick one or pick two, and, and that's the most you can pick. And sit down and really going to get, get a good temperature of what's going on in everybody's mind. And then get to that point. So I would say if you're going to do another amendment mm -hmm. to the Constitution, it may be something like that where you say certain things when they get to a, a basically a, a loggerheads in Congress and then in the political process, we offer those things up to be more put it on the agenda, on the, on the, the uh, voting agenda, and let the citizens def decide individually, or let the states decide individually. I mean, one of the things that was written into the Constitution um, specifically was, um, like for the presidential elections, the Electoral College. And, and there's a lot of controversy around that, particularly right now, because Hillary Clinton won a popular vote, um, Donald Trump won the Electoral College. Um, in our law, he's the president. Whether you voted for him or didn't like him, whether you liked him, whether you're a Republican that didn't like him, you know, he's the mm -hmm. president. But people go, well, but it should be popular vote. Well, no, it shouldn't be, because the Constitution says it shouldn't be, specifically. And it, it shouldn't be changed, I don't think, because that means that if you want to campaign in just California, Texas, and New York, you can always win elections. Mm -hmm. And the more money you spend nowadays on elections, it's all marketing. It's not quality of candidate, it's all marketing. You never hear a, a political pundit say, well, this is the best candidate because they've, they've got two PhDs and they've got 15 years of experience in business and they've, they've flown a spaceship before and you know they've got all these qualifications, they should be president. No, it's so-and-so raised $20 million in this campaign. So-and-so raised $300 million. To, they're going to win because they got the best marketing campaign. Is that the way you want to pick politicians? That's the way we pick them today. I was going to say, that's kind and of how we're Unfortunately, right now. that's not a good sign. Yeah. We need to get away from this. What I heard, the most common term I heard talking about that was called retail politics. Mm -hmm. We need to get away from real t retail politics and get back to, hey, really, what do you stand for? Right. And vote for people based on that. Definitely. I think we could talk for more. And I just got the thing in the ear telling me that we're <laughs> coming up. And I wanted to talk a lot, a lot of about a lot of other stuff. Yeah. And I think we could probably spin this into a longer conversation. Yeah. About Second Amendment, we're on. T totally. I'm, I, I want to talk about that for sure. The Second Amendment, especially here in Hawaii, because of the sort of, I don't, I don't, I, I have, like I said, I have a hard time saying difficulty to get weapons here. I understand the logic behind it and all the, it is, it's harder to get one here than say in New Mexico or another state. And just in America, that just seems wrong. Like it should just be like, it's like this everywhere. And you know, you hear all the sort of the madness on this side, the madness on this side, and it, there's gotta be a happy medium. And I think again, it just comes down to somebody deciding this is how it is and it's gonna be a while. We'll talk about that later, for sure. This has been On The Go. If you're listening on the podcast, I really appreciate it. If you just watch this on YouTube, um, click on some link or subscribe or whatever you want to do or tell a friend. That's really cool. Uh, tweet us, all that kind of good stuff at ThinkTech Hawaii, thinktechhawaii.com. Stan, thanks very much for being on. It was Here's super fun. Dude. Oh, is this for all me? Uh, you know, just really quickly before we go, Ben Carson, check him out. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving him away. Thank you very much, Stan. We'll talk about this again. All right, everybody. All right. Aloha.